Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. Most of our displays in here are on loan from other people. We do own some of the stuff, but the majority is on loan from other people. The way it got started was I had a, I've always had a dream of having a museum. Me and my wife had discussed different ways the way we could do it, and we didn't see what was feasible. And then by a word of grapevine, a gentleman learned that we were wanting to start the museum, and he contacted us and talked to us, and we looked at the building, and we finally decided we could make a go of it. At the same time, they were starting what they called the Foundation for Pinckneyville, and that's where we actually started through the foundation for Pinckneyville. And the first three years, the property was actually owned by the foundation of Pinckneyville. And then for tax reasons, it was transferred to the Illinois Real Heritage Museum as owners of it. It's a nonprofit organization. We have 14 board members and anybody that makes a dollar donation we have a 501c3, which is, makes it tax deductible. Okay, the house place we built that mainly so that uh, the generations would kind of understand how Grandma and Grandpa's house would have been, a little four room house. Uh, you got your kitchen with a true wood burning coal burner stove, stove in it. That's a Hoosier cabinet. Yeah, and you had it where the, you kept your, Spices up on the top shelf and your plates and that in there. Those plates are actually the ones Mary had out of where she was being raised at home. Wow. And whenever you made bread, you could pull that out and make bread on that. Well, you put your flour out to roll your dough on. Well, when you get done, you got flour there. You don't want to throw that away. So you take this and scrape your flour up back up off your breadboard and save it. And that's what this was kind of a more of a fancy one than using your hand to brush it up with. Right, right. <laughs> Here is a little bit more modern than one of the we got back in the back. They call it a coolator. It's an ice box, true ice box. You put your ice up here in the top and it had a drain line that come out for to drain the water out if it melted. And then you put your food down here. And what's odd about some of these older stuff, that's the first thing that scrape off of something nowadays. It tells everything about cleaning it and how to take care of it. This is a bedroom with a rope bed. I might have to re-tighten it again one of these days, it's starting to sag, but you can tighten them ropes up. You work them and tighten them up as they sag. This rope here goes all the way back and forth and ends up down there, it's 50 foot long. This rope here goes back and forth and ends up over on that side over there, and it's 50 foot long. It takes 100 foot of rope to do the bed. That crib over there has been through six generations of kids. This one here has been through five generations that we know of. We know the family that owned it. If you enjoy seeing how our ancestors lived during America's rural yesterday, you're going to love looking at these books. Volume 1 is field work showing horses and vintage tractors preparing seed beds, planting, cultivating, and harvesting the crop. Volume 2 shows the work being done in the barn and farmyard. 
feeding and watering the livestock, getting the crop into the barn, milking the cows, shearing the sheep, and collecting the eggs. In volume three, we go inside the home to see the family in the kitchen canning vegetables, in the parlor listening to the radio, and in the dining room for family supper. We also head into town to shop at the general store or visit on the town square on Saturday night. Each book has over 140 large format pages. They sell for $24.95 each, or you can buy two for $44.95, or all three for $54.95 plus shipping. Call 1-877-647-2452 to order. That's 1-877-647-2452. And this is the washroom. We didn't have room to build a back porch, back porch yep. so we put made the room, put the washer machine inside. Yep. Now this air wash machine here actually come out with a gasoline motor. Okay. And you could buy a kit from Maytag and put an electric motor on it. Okay. I have the gasoline motor for it, but I don't have, I don't want to set it up here on this floor. This clothes dryer but, is pretty unique. Yeah. That's pretty neat. Yeah, then just pull up until you stop and then it lays out. That's pretty clever. This here is just a runabout buggy. She's in the winter time and she's out riding in the buggy and you didn't want your feet to get too cold. You could take this. Pull a little tray out, fill this full of charcoal. And you set it on a couple brick baths in there and that'd keep your feet warm. These here was actually more used for building log houses. Okay. To handle the logs or the railroad ties. Okay. And this here was used more, it could be used for ice, but it was used more for pulling a log up sure. on a log house where he was building log houses. Sure. Different people call them different things. This is actually a hay fork for forking hay. This is more of a manure fork for manure. And this is a mixture between a hay fork and a manure fork. Just a little bit littler hay fork. Two more bone forks. This here we don't know. I figure it's blacksmith made and it was used probably for pulling corn down in the corn crib sure. or something like that. Right, right, yeah, for drawing it down. But we don't know. Yep. You can see where they drilled the hole in it to split it to make the two prongs. Right, right. And people call these silage forks, but they're fodder forks. Okay. You never shovel fork silage with that. <laughs> this is a water pump for use around steam engine. It's a double throw. It pumps going either direction. It was for pumping water out of the pond or road ditch or something into your water tank. Then you use it to pump the water tank into the steam engine tank. Out of this stuff here, okay, we talk about a wheat drill going down between corn rows. Yes. Pulled by a horse. Yes. Horse want to eat the corn. Right. You put this on the horse, he can still drink water because he eats the corn. Well, when you hand pick corn, you put this on the horse closest to the row so he couldn't keep steel ears. What this was for. Okay. You need a piece of stove pipe. You cut your tin, you cut your pipe off the right length. Well, once you cut it off, it don't have the crimps anymore where you slide them together. This here, you take this around the pipe and crimp the ends so that they'd slide together again. The way you didn't waste a chunk of stove pipe because you can make it where you could reuse it. This is a corn binder. We know it was built before 1906 because in 1906 or 1907, they put an accumulator table so they could catch several bundles and put a gearbox down there. Right. And this is patent 193, I think, yeah. But in here, it's got a knotter that ties a string around the bundle, and it's just like bale hook and everything, just like a modern binders or modern hay balers got on them and that. Now we do own, me and Mary own that one. <coughs> we got one of these at home yet, but this here 
one here come from Grayville, Illinois. You put your bundles out of there, out of shock, haul them in. You put them up on there, you feed it through here. It snapped the ear off, take your shucks off. The ear went up the elevator to your wagon or grain bin. Everything else went through this shredder and it cut it up for corn fodder okay. for the cows. Any corn that this shelled off landed on a tray down there, come down and come up a little elevator here and you cut your shelled corn here so it didn't go to waste. What do you call this? Husker Shredder. Husker Shredder, okay. And it was built around 1962 because in 1907 they put a, they changed this here blower in the pictures in the book, they turned this blower up because the barns was getting taller to blow in a barn. This was too much of an angle to get to them. I have to have fold up so people can walk through here. Sure. This here is mostly haying equipment. We've got our rope snatch blocks back there, blocking tackles. I think them's all wire stretchers there. The difference between a blocking tackle and a wire stretcher a wire stretcher has a brake on it. Okay. A block and tackle don't have a brake. Okay. That's it. That's the only difference. These can be used for block and tackle, but if you use a block and tackle for stretching wire, you got to tie your rope off. <laughs> Where these got brakes on them. What's this for? That come off the same farm that that potato plow come off of. Okay. And what we're thinking and what Craig was thinking, if you, you shut your eyes and you feel this around, right there is where they held it. Okay. You can feel it. Okay. Yep. It was for chopping potatoes up instead of cutting them with a knife just for, re for seed potatoes. Sure. It's blacksmith made, but that's what it was used for cutting seed potatoes. Okay. If you was out on a snowy day or a muddy day, get your old Model A stuck. Put that against the tar, slide this through the rim, and hook it. Them your tar chains. <laughs> Pretty simple. Pretty nice. Well, they had the spoke wheels. You could just put them between the spokes. And right. This here's a hay sling. You would lay this on your wagon before you loaded your hay on it. And there were two different ways they used them. One of them you'd put so much hay on top of it and then you'd lay another sling on and so much hay on top of that. But most of them, they used this on the wagon, you'd use your regular hay fork to take down so far on the hay and then you'd take what was left on the wagon up with this. It's got a trip here where it tripped in the middle to dump the hay. And hay forks, you had a whole lot of these pulleys here in a barn so you could run a rope all the way down through the barn, down over outside, and down so you could have a tractor or horses or that to pull the hay up with. These here, whenever it got up to its top, it rolled back into the barn and then you tripped it. Then when you went to take it back down to the ground, you had a rope on this, you'd pull it back out of the barn and it'd trip. And then this would drop all the way down to your wagon. Then whenever it pulled up, it relatched. Nice. There's a set of hay forks there that spread out. Yep. Uh, there's a set already spread, stays spread out. Uh -huh. But this, a lot of this here in later days, uh, they used them bales on right. these. Right. But these was all designed for loose hay. And you had a spear one, single spear, which I don't see how it would work on other than maybe Red Top or Timothy. It would work on alfalfa, but it worked on the same order as your double spear. Yeah, and that picture does a good job of showing the length of that rope. Yeah, and if you can get close enough, you can see a board across there and across there. Yep. That's the hay sling. Yep. yep. Depends on how big a supports you had up here is how much you could take up at once. Sure. That one there, they've got a pretty heavy hay fork in it to take up. He's taking a whole wagon load up at a time. Right. 
If you enjoy seeing how our ancestors lived during America's rule yesterday, you're going to love looking at these books. Volume 1 is fieldwork showing horses and vintage tractors preparing seed beds, planting, cultivating, and harvesting the crop. Volume 2 shows the work being done in the barn and farmyard, feeding and watering the livestock, getting the crop into the barn, milking the cows, shearing the sheep, and collecting the eggs. In Volume 3, we go inside the home to see the family in the kitchen canning vegetables, in the parlor listening to the radio, and in the dining room for family supper. We also head into town to shop at the general store or visit on the town square on Saturday night. Each book has over 140 large format pages. They sell for $24.95 each, or you can buy two for $44.95, or all three for $54.95 plus shipping. Call one 877 647 2452 to order. That's 1-877-647-2452. That is a silver king made in, uh, oh gosh, Ohio. Can't remember the town, Plymouth. How do I know that? Plymouth, Ohio. When they first started making a silver king tractor, they made a silver king. They made it, called it Plymouth. Had Plymouth down the radiator. Plymouth Car Company filed suit against them. Sure. Well, they had a tractor sitting outside out there and they was repainting their building and the wind blowed some of the paint over on it. That's the reason they painted them silver for Silver King. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's why they went named Silver King. This here is one of my, me and Mary own this one. It's the biggest international they made that year, 2236. And this is a starter for it. And surprisingly, this in here ain't much harder to crank than what the little ones are. Is that right? And I'll crank any of my own tractors, but I won't crank somebody else's. What makes a difference is how you set this magneto in here. You've got a spark lever that runs back there. You set that out there, if you got it timed right, and set that out there like that, it will not kick when you're cranking it. Okay. Now, if you've got the timing off one tooth here, it will. So you gotta know where you wanna set that because down, all the way down shuts it off, all the way up is what you're running on. And that's what makes a difference whether you wanna kick while you're cranking it. And if you don't know where to set the spark lever on them, you got a chance of it kicking on you. Now I can crank start this one yet. The old Samson that was up on the other end, I can't crank start it anymore. It's too hard to turn anymore. But that's the original radiator cap, the plow. Plow, yeah. Plow, it's a plowing tractor, 1936. But it is electric start though. Okay. This was the last year, see Hart Par, Oliver bought Hart Par out. This was the last year that they, was a Hart Par Oliver combination whenever uh, Oliver took Hart Par over. This here's a Moline Universal. Got a set of plows on it right now, but you got a pin down here you take out, this pin here and that pin back there. You want to set it jackknifed, have your other equipment over there, take it up, crank this around, and you can set it down on your dish, your binder, your mower. Really? Yeah, you can change the implements. In the Moline book, there's 37 different type of implements that go behind this. Really? There's even one, just two wheels for a cart for pulling wagons. John Deere dealer in Oakville owns it. This one here, I've never heard run. <clears throat> I've tried to get it. I was going to check and see if I could get it started one day for him. I put a belt on it and had it spinning. Well, I wasn't getting hot enough spark out of the mag. Huh. But they had it running about 12 years ago, and I know the motor's not stuck. Spinning it, oil pressure come up good. So if it had the mag fixed on it and the carburetor cleaned, it would run yet. The old Avery, my uncle had this down in Fort Worth, Texas. I bought it off of him, the same one that built a little steam engine. It actually was built in Peoria, Illinois. Ben Mary's owned it for almost 30 years. He had it, I don't know, 20 years before we did. Him and ever since we've tried to locate another one. We found one in Fargo, about 70 miles northwest of Fargo, North Dakota. 
it don't have a blade under it either, and it don't run. That's what we're looking for, another one, to be able to build a blade like it's supposed to have. It's, it's a road grader. Gra road grader, road grader, road grader. And so as far as we've known in the last 40 years, there's only two of these exist. Wow. This has been in uh, Antique Power magazines, and I don't know what all my different magazines, asking for another one, and never, never have got any reply back. The old Huber, the come off the same farm the big thrash machine come off of. Verna May, Moore, Los, used to be Verna May Los. Her husband had these and uh, he's not living anymore. She wanted it so that she could drive it in the parades. So me and Josh Giacomo worked on it, got it running good. Josh got it running and then we put new tires on it for her. She wanted tires, so she bought new tires and got them mounted. And it hadn't been drove enough to even mark the tires. This is another one I bought off my uncle down in Texas. Actually, this one here, we've got still pictures of it. There's a video somewhere, and we can't get a hold of one, of it in a cotton field for a Dickie Blue Jean commercial. Right. This is a military tractor I was talking about. The reason, the guy that originally got a hold of it, my uncle worked for Bell Helicopter down in Fort Worth, Texas. These was loaded on a helicopter in 1958 and sent to Iran. Three of these was. What happened to the other two, I have no idea. But in 1962, this one showed up, Bell Helicopter on a big huge helicopter and got unloaded down there. My uncle was over, he was a, over the test pilots on the brand new helicopters. That was his job. Well, he seen him unloading it. Well, he got a phone call and had to go back in the office and he come back out, the tractor was gone. So he grabs one of his pilots, they get in a brand new helicopter, start flying over Fort Worth, Dallas, Texas. They see it going down the road on a trailer. So that's how he knew where it went. So he kept onto that guy, trying to buy it off of him. The guy wouldn't sell it, wouldn't sell it. Well, they keep, every time he took the helicopter out for tests, every once in a while they'd fly over it. Well, he found it sitting out in the fence row. So that's when he bought it, finally bought it. I had a knee operated on, wasn't allowed, I was on crutches. I started stripping paint off because the guy that got it painted it red. Okay. And it's losing this red paint here, natural. This here I've took the red paint off of. Uh -huh. But whenever I stripped this off, it had U.S. Army on here. Okay. But I was using a stripper and it went through the OD green paint down to U.S. Air Force. I'll be darned. This was built for the Air Force, but then the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers got it. It's Corps of Engineers yeah, tag I see on it. Yeah. And uh, they used it over there until 1962 when Vietnam was breaking out. That's when it was brought back home. But on this plaque fender right here, it's got a plaque on there. Rebuilt in MGDI Ran 561. This here is the first tractor my grandfather bought. Really? Wow. He actually bought it in 39 from a neighbor that bought a 39H. This to actual take tractor, place. not one like it, but this actual This tractor. actual tractor. Wow. He bought in 1939, it had steel wheels on it. Hmm. Uh, they cut it down, put it on rubber. After my dad got killed, he had a 1020. Grandpa was afraid us kids, my mom's dad, was afraid us kids get hurt on that 1020. So he gave us this to farm with. I started farming with this, taking it to the field by myself in 1952 when I was seven years old. We've spent three episodes of this program looking at the exhibits at the Illinois Rural Heritage Museum in Pinckneyville and have still not come close to showing all of it. Hopefully, though, we've shown enough for you to get an idea of the quality and scope of this first-rate agricultural museum. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319 362 3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.